keeping with Urban Airships 8 bit theme that they have all around the office. Uh, I kind of went with these slides here. So, how to architect for mini screens? In other words, creating a cross platform phone gap app. That's kind of it. We see a lot of phone gap apps that hit one platform, and people are still learning how to actually design their code and their layout so that it actually runs well on multiple platforms. So as a heads up, uh, I'm Michael Brooks. I work at Nitobi, and uh, my handle around the web is mwbrooks. I do a lot of BlackBerry development for uh, the WebWorks platform. Uh, I do iOS. I um, do quite a bit of the PhoneGap docs stuff. Um, I'm getting a little bit more into Android now. so. From my perspective, I tend to care less about which PhoneGap platform I'm working on, and I care more about the consistency across all of the platforms. So maybe that's why I'm doing this talk here. So to begin with, there's no cheat codes. There's no one approach that's going to give you a cross-platform PhoneGap application. Um, on the upside, there's really no right or wrong way to even do it. It's, uh, it's kind of nice that way. You can choose your favorite JavaScript framework, uh, whether it's Sencha Touch or jQuery Mobile or Dojo Mobile. Um, just accept whatever limitations they have, whatever limitations for platform-wise they have. If you choose to roll your own framework, well, just be aware of what target platforms you're working on, and that's your limitation. So um, yeah, there's no real cheat code there. The, um, the best bet is to actually just know your enemies, know what platforms you're going to be targeting. And know what their limitations are, um, know how fast their browsers are, know how big and small their screens are. From a designer's point of view, that's very important. Know the interaction types. Lots of phones are touch-based, but not all of them are. There's a whole bunch of pointer-based ones. So swipes or uh, touch and hold, those things don't work so well when you're dealing with a pointer device. They're also not so intuitive to the user. So, um, a typical pointer device, you'd never think of pressing down and holding for a while so that some context menu would pop up. So just be aware of these. And the best part is to just actually look at it before you start developing your application, before you start doing your wireframes, even ideally before you start doing your requirements. And just keep it in the back of your mind the whole time so that while you're working on your application, you start to structure it and move it in a way that's actually going to work well on all of these platforms. So it's OK to be different. Um, this is something that's slowly going away, but even just a year ago, everyone wanted tab bars and fixed headers. They want them really bad. And they try to shove them onto an Android device because iPhone had a tab bar. And it looked stupid on an Android device. So it's OK to be different. Abstract that menu in JavaScript so that it's a context menu on an Android. It's a tab bar on an iPhone device. And it's a pop-up menu from the hardware button on a BlackBerry. It's not that hard to do. I think Cloud4 did an awesome job of that. They had this one demo where they actually had a tab bar on the bottom. And then they showed the Android device. And it was gone. It was, that functionality was still there. You just had to push the actual context button. And it worked. Um, another one I think that's fairly common is this pull and refresh that's pretty common with Twitter on the iPhone. It's not so intuitive on a BlackBerry device. It's not so intuitive even on an Android. And the reverse is true. A context menu that's pulled down on Android not that common on an iPhone device. Users aren't going to think of it. So it's OK to be different. Get that functionality there, but show it in different ways and just abstract it so that code-wise, you don't even have to think about it. You can just say what the menu is and just have a strong confidence that it'll actually work on all the platforms. Also be adaptive. So from a design side, your layout should be more adaptive. If you have a small screen compared to a tablet, you know, a responsive design would work well so that you can actually um, choose whatever kind of uh, border cross section so that the application will change. Um, another side that I think of more is being adaptive with the effects. So an iPhone has hardware acceleration. That's cool. So you can fade things out and fade things in and show shadows and gradients. It's pretty slow in a lot of Android devices. 2.3 is quite fast, but older devices, you want to get rid of those gradients, you want to get rid of those shadows. And while the app may not look so good to you, the catch is that an Android user doesn't have a better Android device. They don't have an iPhone. They don't realize that your application does support shadows or gradients. So it really doesn't matter. Even just slide transitions. On an older BlackBerry device, just kill it. Don't try to write time, time loops that slowly transition things in. BlackBerry users on older devices aren't expecting that. 
again, Cloud4 showed a great example where they kind of just gave up on uh, creating the, the old BlackBerry 4 application, and they showed that website, and the website was pretty boring, but all the content was there. So the user could hit it and go with it. And that's what a BlackBerry user running a 4.6 device is going to expect. If you give them a, a very nice looking application, but it's running slow, they're not going to like it. If you give them a not so nice looking application that actually looks the same as every other application they have, but all the functionality is there, that's very important. So just be adaptive in your mindset. So fill your inventory. Uh, what I mean by this is that PhoneGap supports the mobile web. It really just supports the web. And the web has dealt with this the whole time. You're not developing for a, a Linux browser or a Windows browser or a Mac browser. And so go ahead and use all of the wonderful libraries that are out there for the web already and fill your inventory with those. Um, from my perspective, I, I've been working on these kind of cross-platform phone gap applications for about a year and a bit now. And we've tried um, rolling our own frameworks. We've tried using uh, JQ Touch. We've tried using jQuery Mobile. Um, and I think the best approach that we've found so far is whatever framework, whatever library you're going with, implement the base initially. It doesn't have to look awesome, but all of the requirements for your application are there. Someone can click through them and get a feel for the application almost immediately. It just doesn't look that great. After you have that base, add some polyfills in. These are, this is a new term um, that's kind of popping up, but the idea is that um, if you're running an older browser or a, a slightly different browser, you can add a polyfill that'll just implement um, a feature that a modern browser may have. Um, a polyfill that I wrote that I think is very useful, and it's also a very simple example of a polyfill, is touch support. So if you're dealing with older BlackBerry devices, and even some of the newer devices out there are like this too, they only support mouse down, mouse up, and mouse move. They don't support touch events. And so this polyfill simply adds touch support so that from your code as a programmer, you can subscribe to touch start. And you don't care if it's actually an old BlackBerry device because you know that touch start is actually going to fire when they do a mouse down. And even the new BlackBerry devices are a little weird, the torch, because it has a touch screen and a trackball. And so you don't want to be programming for both those events. Instead, just allow this polyfill to step in. So after you have your base application, add those polyfills in and get the requirements done. Afterwards, you can start enhancing it. You can start adding a feature into it. And you can do feature detection just to decide whether or not you can support that feature. If you can't support that feature, just have a good default. Something that's basic, something that nails down your requirements, but that's it. So it's not that hard. Um, Geolocation is even a decent one where some devices still don't have geolocation. So you need to have just a decent default if that device can't have it. And even if the device does have geolocation, the user may just disable it for your, for your phone or for your particular application. Um, I'm from Canada. So when I came down here, I disabled all my geolocation services. And I quickly realized that I actually use a lot of them, even though I didn't think about it. Um, after you've got those basic features going, you can, start to, um, you can start to enhance it a little bit more. Um, just, I don't know where I want to go with this. Um, I'll just leave it with that. So the point is more or less that you just want to have your base application. You want to add your polyfills. And finally, you want to start to add a little bit of feature detection with good defaults falling off. And that will nail a surprising number of uh, platforms. Um, a recent one that we wrote uh, was written for quite a few of the tablet devices. And um, BlackBerry brought in a playbook back before they existed. And we actually just loaded the application on there. We didn't even have PhoneGap for the playbook at the time, but we kind of muddled it up and just got this application built onto it. And it worked perfectly. It looked great. It was awesome. The only downfall was that it didn't play video. And that's just because we don't have the PhoneGap plugin to render the actual video for it. So um, avoid deleveling. You guys have probably heard this quite a bit, but the point is test your code. So um, in my personal experience, I found that uh, writing a bunch of unit tests goes a long, long way. Especially when you're just running it on a brand new device, you can just pound out those unit tests and get a feel for whether or not this application is even going to work on yours. Um, personally, I use QUnit. I like it just because of the simplicity of it. It's really easy to get up and running. It doesn't let you do very much. The tests actually look quite clean. But you can use anything you want as long as it's going to run on all of the platforms that you're targeting. Um, functional tests or scenario tests are 
um, good, but personally I found that I don't write them very well. Um, they're hard to maintain, they're hard to use, um, but we're, we've been experimenting with it. I wrote um, a QUnit extension or something like that, you might want to call it a plugin, um, called uh, Dominator that just allows you to programmatically walk through your interface. It works okay, but I still don't use it that much. Um, but regardless of whether or not you're doing functional tests, I found actually a good QA tester helps a lot. Um, in a recent project that's been going on for about eight months, we've had a dedicated QA guy for a project. And so every day when I release a build, this guy's nuts. He just sits down and he does the same steps on all of the platforms that we're targeting. And then you'll start issuing, um, well, issuing logs or tickets or whatever you want to call them um, about the problems. And personally, as a developer, I don't have the time to do that. But if you guys can find someone to actually just sit down, even for an hour a day at the beginning, and just run through the same steps ruthlessly on every platform, that nails out a whole bunch of bugs. It'll be very quick. Um, you'll just stop implementing all of the application's features and just start following his lead on, on what's wrong. Uh, concurrent builds. I think this is actually the, uh, the best thing you can do if you're writing a cross-platform phone gap application is get concurrent builds working immediately. It doesn't matter if you're rolling your own scripts to do the builds, um, like a make file or a rake file or an add file, something like that. So what, what I did in the original project that I worked on, you could also use something like Cordova, which um, we're starting to maintain quite a bit more. But it's just a set of command line tools that allow you to build immediately to iPhone or Android or BlackBerry with just a single command. And so the point is, immediately you can get your BlackBerry simulator up and running just to see if it still works. Because if you're developing on a single platform for a while, you'll likely break your other platforms in the process. Um, this is always a time to plug PhoneGap Build, the little pixelated dude in the top corner there. Um, so with PhoneGap Build, you can upload your assets and we'll build with all your platforms. And very quickly, we're supporting something called Hydra, which just allows you to do an in-app update um, as long as you haven't changed your plugins or your native source code. Um, so it's very quick each day for all of your users and for yourself just to update your application and uh, see what's changed. Um, you could also use something like Worklight that they just talked about. That's a great idea just to be able to right click and deploy to a single platform. Dreamweaver has an extension now that does the same thing. So there's plenty of options out there. But the point is just get something going. This will go a huge way if you can just pop that simulator up or get it on a device almost immediately. So in the end, the mindset really is just you shouldn't be thinking about any one device when you're working on a phone gap application. If your requirements or your wireframes mention a specific device, if your wireframes are encased in an iPhone or Android, um, frame, it's probably a bad sign immediately. Uh, you just need to kind of keep them all in the back of your mind. Know what devices you want to be targeting. Keep them in the back of your mind so that when you're making a decision, you know that you have to abstract that single menu area. Or, um, you know, this, this particular concept won't carry forward. Badges is something that I ran into recently where um, we support a push notification, Urban Airships push notification actually, on all of our platforms. And the client wanted badges to appear, which is something that's very common in iOS. And so they wanted the badge to appear on the icon, but also badges to appear throughout the application on buttons and things like that. And it's just kind of weird on an Android and a Blackberry. And it's actually not possible to display those badges sometimes on the icon. So you know, keep that in mind. If you know what platforms you're targeting immediately, maybe you can find out a better solution. Or um, you can just really consider whether or not you want to do it. It might be a waste of time. Um, but yeah, think about them all, build and test all your applications. And uh, again, I work at Nitobi. Um, a bunch of these pixelated graphics were by Tim Kim, another guy who works at Nitobi. He's a developer, but in his spare time he likes to do pixel art. So if you like some of the pictures, the build bot, the Nitobi symbol, or the phone gap uh, icon, hit up Tim Kim at Nitobi or just find him up on Twitter at Tim Kim. That's it.